Good morning, and welcome to the 80th Landon Lecture on Public Issues. Before I introduce our speaker, let me introduce the other members of the platform party. On your right, Dr. Cornelia Flora, Professor of Sociology and President of the K-State Faculty Senate. Let's give her a big hand. Next, Troy Lubers, Senior in Business from Arkansas City and President of the Student Body. On your left, Edward Seaton, publisher of the Manhattan Mercury and chairman of the Landon Patrons. Ed? And next to him, Dr. Charles Reagan, assistant to the president and chairman of the Landon Lecture Series. As an historian myself, it gives me special pleasure to introduce Barbara Tuckman who is one of this country's foremost historians and authors. We are especially pleased that her husband, Dr. Lester Tuckman, is with us in the audience today. And Lester, would you please stand up and let's give him a real big hand. What a gentleman, right here. Barbara Tuckman graduated from Radcliffe College, after which she took up writing positions for the Institute for Pacific Relations and later the magazine The Nation in Tokyo and in Spain, where she covered the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. Her first book was The Lost British Policy, Britain and Spain Since 1700, which was published in 1938. Her second book, Bible and Sword, England and Palestine from the Bronze Age to Balfour, was published in 1956. Her first Pulitzer Prize came for her 1962 book, The Guns of August, which is a moving account of the origin of the First World War and the first month of that war from August 4th to September 4th, 1914. By the way, many of these books are in our bookstore, which is an account of governments acting against their own self-interest in the face of contemporary warnings to the contrary. Among the examples she chooses in this book are the Trojans dragging the Greek horse inside the walls of the city, the Renaissance popes forcing the Protestant Reformation, the many British policy mistakes which trigger the American Revolution, and finally the series of strategic blunders which lead to the infamous war called Vietnam. In addition to many other honors, Barbara Tuckman has received 22 honorary doctorates. She has served as president of the Society of American Historians and as president of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She has also received the Order of Leopold from the Belgium government. This morning, it certainly is an honor for me and a privilege for all of us here at Kansas State to hear a great historian and, and a real delight, Barbara Tuckman, on this topic. Where are the progressive Republicans? Let's have a real big hand for Barbara Tuckman. Thank you. It's very nice to have such a, such a warm welcome, and I appreciate it from all of you. I hope I have this thing organized for once. Mr. President and Senator Kassebaum and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, something happened here. Now it got Xeroxed and I think it got out of order. No, oh, that's your letter. That's <laughs> right here. Oh yes. Thank you. As we approach 
if I'm not speaking correctly into the microphone, please yeah, somebody yeah. holler. As we approach the quadrennial moment of national decision in American politics, it's appropriate to commemorate Governor Landon of Te Kansas, a truly American figure drawn from the heartland of the country here in the Mississippi Valley, a man of common sense, competence, and decency, as well as the character that all of us in both parties might count ourselves fortunate to have in national office today. His birthday near this time may put your speaker in something of a spot, depending on that person's political identity, because it is impossible in the midst of a presidential campaign to make a non-political and non-partisan speech. I have to confess that I am neither philosophically nor politically a Republican, as I thought <laughs> As I thought it was only fair to tell your president when he invited me to speak at this event, in case he would have, second, would have second thoughts and wished to withdraw the invitation, <laughs> which would have been perfectly legitimate. But he bravely let it stand. If I say anything you dislike or disapprove, let me assure you it is from no desire to offend, but rather from a not always tactful habit of saying what is on my mind. The first thing on my mind is a question. Where have all the Republican progressives gone, as you once were? And an associated question, why has liberal become such a, which has much the same meaning as progressive, and suggests the same point of view, become a dirty word in America? Why, why does Mr. Reagan find it necessary to say to the Republican convention at New Orleans that the party's opponents are liberal, liberal, liberal. <laughs> In a tone of voice as if he was saying, criminal, criminal, criminal. I found that absurd and offensive and rather hard to understand. In any event, I will come back to this problem, but first, Sorry, my eyes are so bad here. I want to recall for you your past. Once in a wild, eager, agitated time in the opening decade of the century, when popular protests swelled against, the national, um, against national government being managed in the interests of the privileged class, the progressives emerged as a movement. They were not a fringe group, but important, determined men at the heart of the party, with fighting Bob La Follette, governor and later senator of Wisconsin at their head, joined by Senator Hiram Johnson of California, Senators Bora of Idaho, Norris of Nebraska, Beveridge of Indiana. They were followed by teachers, city councilors, legislators, governors, publishers, editors, writers, and most articulate of all, by the Journalist William Allen White of Kansas, editor of the Emporia Gazette, which he'd made famous by his editorial of 1896, What's the Matter with Kansas? Actually, that was not a progressive statement at all. It was an attack on the so-called populists. And I really don't know what was the matter with Kansas, but in any event, became a document of great effect. A yearning for justice was moving in the hearts of the American people of that decade, White believed. We were conscious, he wrote, that the vast injustice that had come with the settlement of the continent, we were conscious of the vast injustice. We all made that part of our creed as representatives of the progressive movement in that glamorous, vigorous decade when America turned the corner from conservatism and had come to the sense that, civil, that our civilization needed recasting and that their government had fallen into the hands of self-seekers and that a new relationship should be established between the haves and the have-nots to release the burden of injustice on our own conscience. The progressive idea was born out of a recognized need for 
legislative restraint on the unbridled plunder by the plutocrats. And there's a big cut marked in here because I felt it was going too long, but anyway, I'll try to find, pick up. Uh, essentially, the new idea was a call for a redirection of the Hamiltonian belief in a strong central government, not to serve the interests of privilege and property, as in recent decades, but instead to serve the interests of the underprivileged and working people who were weak in, in influence and needed the protection by government for democratic justice and equal rights. If in earliest times government had been instituted to secure the position of monarchs and nobles, now it must be used to curtail economic tyranny and protect the weak of the working class. The little people, as they were called in the Middle Ages, the popolo minuto, Italians called them, Basically, this is what the progressives were talking about. The ancient struggle in the social order between property and human rights, between the right wing and the left, unending and never to be settled. It, it recurs in every age, in one form or another, of revolution versus counter-revolution. The Republican National Committeeman for Kansas William Allen White, drafted the Republican Party platform in the off-year congressional elections of 1910. His platform anticipated the New Deal by 20 years, as he writes with some satisfaction in his autobiography, which suggests an unexpected connection with the New Deal from your ancestry. Enthusiastic electioneering in the spring of, in the spring primaries of 1910 by White and a group of his like-minded associates brought in a band of progressive nominees for Congre congressional and gubernatorial office and as delegates to the convention of 1910. In that year, the Progressive Party was organized. It was they, the liberals of that day, who gave the country in Theodore Roosevelt the foremost Republican president we have had since Lincoln. I do not say that Theodore Roosevelt necessarily qualifies as a great man. He was a practical politician who sometimes adjusted principles to his personal ambitions, as when he pushed aside La Follette from the presidential nomination of 1912 and allowed his own name to be put forward in spite of previous denial of that intention. And he could be as devious as his cousin Franklin. He was nevertheless a statesman true to the progressive thrust who filled the need of the time and voiced and spoke for and dramatized the growing demand for reform that by now pervaded American minds and was finding expression in newspapers, magazines, and books, the media of that time, which, which filled their pages with disclosures by the muckrakers about the scandals and spoil system of the big corporations and the price fixing by the railroad magnates and the trust. Lodged in Rockefeller's Standard Oil and Morgan's Combine U.S. Steel, the largest, though the first billion dollar corporation in America, these, where am I now? Um, these were the new rulers of America called the robber barons. They were the predators of the age. And with the same fierce assertion of the right to domineer as the barons of the 14th century. They had no concept of an ordered state. They wanted only to be let alone to make a great deal of money. They had no interest in politics, except insofar as they, as they could corrupt government through Congress to leave them in freedom to pursue power and riches. In six years, between 18, what is, 66 and 1872, Union Pacific spent $400,000 in bribes. In 10 years, between 1875 and 85, graft cost the Central Pacific as much as 500,000 annually. All this is recorded by the 
respected historian Richard Hofstetter in his book, The American Historical Tradition, page 170, in case anybody wants to check. <laughs> um, these practices and the same and the sums involved were made public by the investigation that broke in the campaign year of 1872 over the ultimate scandal of Credit Mobilier, a construction company working for the Union Pacific, which was discovered to have been distributing shares in the company as bribes among influ influential congressmen. America, the America of Jefferson's ideal of the self-sufficient farmer, cultivating his own land and marketing his own produce, America of the miners and storekeepers and craftsmen and small businessmen, and of the pioneer immigrants who had left the poverty and oppression of their own lands to seek a better life in the great fresh land of freedom across the Atlantic. Basque, shepherds, Jewish intellectuals, um, Irish peasants, Italian stonemasons. These new Americans were not prepared to live under old oppressions they knew too well and in conditions no better than they had escaped. Their impoverishment of farmers gouged by railroad freights, of miners squeezed by company stores, of urban workers crowded into the airless dirt of city slums and sweatshops, was not silent. Around about 1890, in the last decade of the old century, it grew loud and importunate in demands for reform First of all, for revision of the protective tariff, named for Senator Aldrich, the most hated measure of all, which allowed the industrialists to keep prices up to the detriment of the poor. Next, for regulation of the railroad rates, politically for establishment of the electoral primaries and the secret ballot, to open up the smoke-filled rooms and bring about direct election of senators, for civil service reform and to make merit determined by competitive examination rather than pat patronage the basis for appointment to office. And in the economic field for, the, for a federal income tax, prosecution of the trust with jail terms mandated, mandated for violators for pure food and drug drug law aimed at the meat packers, and in the labor field for shorter working hours to a 10-hour day, for workmen's compensation, for federal child labor law, for collective bargaining, with workers entitled to choose their own representatives. Finally, those laws, for laws empowering the Interstate Commerce Commission in, to govern the, in these matters. Out of the discontents underlying these demands of the working and middle class emerged the progressive movement in the Midwest and Far West, whose voice originally was yours and whose leaders were Republican. In the opening decade of the new century, the conscience of the world was moving, White believed. Economic adversity and labor troubles in the 80s and 90s had brought recognition that to keep the country prosperous, society must be organized <coughs> for collective action in the public interest, not left to the savage laissez-faire of private greed. The turning of the century was a time of tremendous change in the nation. The frontier was closed, free land was no longer available. Greater literacy and wider schooling at the level of the common man had fostered greater understanding of the liaison of government and big business as the source of the working man's grievances and taught him what were the reforms needed to right his wrongs. Progressives listened and took heed, shaping their program accordingly. As the demands infiltrated Republican minds, especially in the Midwest, the most significant expression of progressive thinking was Theodore Roosevelt's major speech of August 1910 at Osawatomie, the home of John, John Brown. In a forthright statement of the fundamental issue, the president declared that, and I quote, we are face to face with 
with new conceptions of the relations of property to, to human welfare. And he announced boldly, quote again, that property is a subject, is subject to the general right of the community to regulate its use to whatever degree the public welfare may require. That was a direct challenge by rule, to rule by, by the plutocrats. Indeed, the, to the very nature of government as it was understood by the old guard, who saw it instead as their instrument, deriving from the right of property to be used in their interest. A single speech does not make a summer. Roosevelt's challenge altered no attitudes. Both sides, conservatives and reformers, were too deeply entrenched in their positions to change. Yet protest was growing louder, and in the congressional elections of 1910, produced a landslide for the Democrats, who had already embraced and were calling for the same reform measures sought by the progressives. At this time, it was becoming unmistakable that President Taft, who had been Roosevelt's friend and chosen successor in the White House, was, was deserting his, his sponsor's program and moving back to his natural comrades in the conservative camp. Taft was an intelligent, honest conservative who believed in the existing order and deeply resented <coughs> intruders who would lay hands on it. His amiable manner and friendship had deceived Roosevelt into believing that he would carry out his policies. He did, as an observer remarked, on a shutter. In the bitter fight over conservation of the national parks and wilderness areas, he took, <coughs> he took sides against Gifford Pinchot of Pennsylvania, Roosevelt's champion in the battle for conservation, and against, against a diehard Secretary of the Interior, whose name was Richard Ballinger. He, supported, that's Taft, he supported the old guard Speaker of the House, Joe Cannon, when the insurgent progressive members gathered to oust him. He even expressed support for the Aldrich Tariff, a last indignity that tore apart the Republican Party and brought a battle for control between the Taft forces and the outraged body of progressives calling themselves insurgents. The battle was fought out over the renomination of Taft for president against that for, of Roosevelt, or possibly the Follett, in the convention of 1912. Control of the party was at stake. The convention was not an artificial affair of balloons and paid demonstrators and speeches smoothly read off the teleprompter. It was a contest of genuine men in a fight that would decide the fate of republicanism in the Mississippi Valley and in the nation. In the convention floor of the Coliseum in Chicago in 1912, the split was made visible and dramatic when Elihu Root, chief of the Taft forces, took the chair in his gray striped trousers and black coat, black and morning coat. He was former Secretary of State and Secretary of War, the outstanding corporation lawyer in the United States, erudite and polished, he represented, as William Allen White describes the scene, the impeccable respectability of invested capital. <laughs> he was from every angle, the perfect symbol of a, I'm sorry, I'm stu stumbling so, but it's the shadows. Makes it difficult. Anyway, um, he was the perfect symbol of a property class struggling for the privileges with it, which it honestly chose which it honestly deems to be its rights." End quote. This, the insurgent leader was Herbert Hadley, who as governor of Missouri had a, and a prosecuting attorney in Kansas City, had been fighting for, the, all, for 10 years all, the, all that Root had been defending for 40 years. There they stood, White writes, in that vast, charade that pictured the ancient, the ancient conflict between, on the one hand, aggrandized enterprise and what White rather wistfully calls 
man's sensitivity for the, for the exploited, the uneasy sense of wrong that was disturbing the middle class and the inner urge for justice, which had been the motor of human progress as man has struggled for the thing called liberty through the ages. <clears throat> Those are his words. Again, in his words, these were <coughs> old, old forces in an ancient miracle play of human history that were clashing there in that sultry June day in the Chicago Coliseum. End of quote. The Taft forces controlled the delegates. Root exercised unchallenged authority when he, when he clicked the gavel, when he clicked the gavel, my daughter, when she heard me re read this, said she don't click a gavel, but anyhow, that's what White said. <laughs> when he clicked the gavel on the marble top table, speaker's table, order ensued almost hypnotically. While the convention was melted by rage into a rabble, he stood there calm and serene, looking down on the sweating, wrathful faces in the pit. He was not unaware that the rostrum was surrounded by barbed wire, <laughs> and that he was commander of the police and could have checked a riot by raising his hand. He knew also that, quote, hundreds of his outraged fellow Republicans, men who had once been his friends, were glaring at him with eyes distraught with hate. Fights broke out in the, in the bubbles on the boiling cauldron all over the pit, where our delegates were so full of grudge and resentment that they would give utterance to their fury only in their fists. The police promptly stopped the fights. Root seemed to us like a diabolical sphinx as he pushed the program of the convention through steadily and swiftly as possible. Motion by motion, phase by phase, the steamroller crushed its way toward the nomination of Taft. In the end, Roosevelt, embittered by his rejection, gathered the insurgents for a third, the Bull Moose Party, ultimately by dividing the Republican vote, throwing the election to Woodrow Wilson, who had been nominated by the Democrats. This did not end the history of the progressives, for the new president was as deeply committed to social and political reform as the Republicans. So strong was their, their, their legacy that Alfred Landon, as governor, called himself a progressive, what he called a, <coughs> I'm sorry, a practical progressive. The instinct showed in his proposal for, for the farm mortgage mor moratorium act, which Republicans might well espouse today if they shared Landon's feeling for his fellow citizens of the Midwest which they hardly seem to do. <laughs> Curiously enough, it was in international relations that Landon was most open-minded, speaking out in favor of reopening relations with Red China, whom we were absurdly from whom separated in a policy of non-intercourse, leading, he believed, to disaster. As he said, <coughs> excuse me, I better get some water. There's somewhere down here. I beg your pardon. That's right. Mm. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, as he said from this platform in 1966, he told the audience he'd been using, he'd been urging a change to break, chance to break the permanent, the present deadlock with China for a long time. In Theodore Roosevelt's spirit, he was ready for the new realities, as he called them, with, with new attitudes. And too much pollution, and around us too many lives lived in poverty and squalor, should suggest that Republican devotion to free enterprise cannot stand pat. However, much one may personally sympathize, as I do, with President Reagan's dislike of too much government, and however reluctant one may be to permit its further penetration into our lives, we of whatever party must realize that we cannot stand pat unless prepared for the tide of garbage to creep over our door sills and to spend all our future summers in heat waves of, the 90, of 90 degrees while our rampant technology 
is left unchecked to dissipate the ozone layer. Overpopulation with its ultimate implications is now the darkest cloud on the horizon today. Not so much in our country as in the third world, where millions reproducing must soon overflow their borders. But the only contribution of the present administration to the problem is to withdraw financial support for programs of birth control in Asia in a policy that seems to me just plain dumb. In the 80 years since Republican progressives understood the need for restraint of private greed, the GOP still shies away from federal intervention, as a horse might shy from a wild turkey crossing its path. To the businessman and capitalist, it means interference with free enterprise, which was the reason for the virulent hatred of FDR and the New Deal. By setting wages and prices and hours of labor, it told the businessman how to manage his business, the unforgivable intrusion. The recent <coughs> plant closing bill did the same thing, creating the same kind of wrath and for the same reason. Whenever a movement arises for legislative or judicial action to improve the lot of the working class, it means to the property class that what is going to be given to the poor is something to be taken from the rich. In short, it implies a redistribution of wealth. Liberals are seen as the advocates of this process, which I suppose is one reason why they are regarded as monsters. It is interesting that the same antagonism operated in the period of the American Revolution against the revolutionists and their sympathizers in Britain, who were called levelers because they were seen as threatening the overturn of society and threatening to dispossess the ruling class. Liberals today, I suspect, carry the same connotation as, class, as agents of class war. In addition, of course, they are associated with the whole 60s culture with long hair and Woodstock and all that. In the same way, I could associate the conservative right with opponents of gun control and censors of books in school libraries. We must go back, I think, to Theodore Roosevelt's realistic acknowledgement that changing conditions require changed attitudes. If Republicans are to retain the presidency, they must come out of the petrified forest of negatives and find a pathway beyond, beyond their fear of reform and their desperate affection for home as they once knew it. And they must somehow present a convincing image of concern for the public welfare in terms of people, as distinct from larger matters such as national defense and balance of trade. As an outsider, I should not be telling you what you should do, or somebody asked me what advice I should give to Mr. Reagan, I mean Mr. Bush. However, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> what I have said is simply a practical thought, which, if I recall, the consultant would cost you thousands. <laughs> but I'm happy to offer it free of charge. In closing, I understand we're to have a question and answer period. I would like to reverse the usual format, if I may, and let me ask you a question to find out from the people who feel it their reason for their abhorrence of the liberal. Is there anyone here who wants to s explain for me if my own theories are not adequate, his or her reasons for the antagonism. I fear that it will, after that it will be your turn to ask the questions. Thank you. I think we can go ahead and uh, anybody that would have a, a question or a comment, the, the mics are on the right and on the left. Will you pick them for me? Sure will. Well, I silenced everybody. 
I think. Uh, you see anybody? Yeah, he's still on. Some students have to go to class. Yes, I know. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Tuckman? Uh, right over here. My name's Tom Kirker. I'm an instructor of history. And my question is. What is the reason for the thogification of the Republicans? Why have they become narrow-minded since Teddy Roosevelt? Why has the banner of progressivism been picked up by Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy and Harry Truman? And the legacy now is of a progressive Democratic Party and a narrow-minded Republican Party. What's the, what would be the key event or period of time that changed that? What was the last thing you said? What, what caused the shift? <coughs> um, in essence, what made the Republican Party reactionary? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's always a right, a political right, which, is, which devotes itself to the protection of its known privile <coughs> priv oh, privileges just as, the, as it showed itself in um, <coughs> William Howard Taft. Although he was installed as a progressive by Teddy Roosevelt, his natural instinct, as I said, was to preserve the old order. And I think that there's always a large part of <coughs> society that uh, wants to hold on to what they know and especially to hold on what they possess. There's nothing that so <coughs> infuriates people as feeling that something is, that they own is being taken away. And I think that was felt by the Republicans, uh, by the, at least, the people who became the reactionary right. They felt that they, they were being robbed. We was robbed, you know, as, it's, as the team says, that loses the, loses the baseball game or whatever. They, they, have, they have fought the, the uh, apparent <coughs> action of the left in taking what belonged to them, as they thought. The rights that's, that, in their belief, derived from from the ownership of property and the interference with the old order. And that will always occur and always does occur in history. A, a right wing always appears to protect its possessions and becomes reactionary in that effort. In the revolution, which I've been working on lately, the violence felt by the so-called loyalists who were, who were uh, pro-British is unbelievable, the, the hatred for the revolutionists, because they felt the revolutionists were, as I say, were threatening to dispossess the governing class as they knew it. And it's a very um, instructive example of why a right appears. Certainly the, the class hatred at that time, we, ne we don't think of the revolution as a class war, but it, it became one between the revolutionists, the patriots so-called, and, and the loyalists, and generated an enormous feeling of hatred very similar to, or much, even much more violent than what we have now, but the same, th I think it's the same thing. I don't know if this answers your question. Okay, yes, that, that's fine, thank you. Here's a question over here. Mrs. Tuckman, I appreciated very much many of your comments and on the subject, but it struck me that uh, your indication that Republican progressivism died in 1912 or uh, that was my impression, that, that you were saying that there really hasn't been much Republican progressivism since that time. 
Uh, what about uh, Senators Mark Hatfield and, and Lowell Weicker? Uh, wouldn't you include uh, President Eisenhower uh, in the category of progressive Republican? No. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I admire Eisenhower as a president because he, he uh, didn't fall for the dullest business of brinks, brinksmanship, you know? And he kept the country solidly uh, in, a, in a peaceful position. And he had a lot of sense, too. But I wouldn't say he was a progressive. Would you count uh, Senator Hatfield as a progressive? Yes, but he certainly is not representative. In fact, he's regarded as a, as a, um, you know, a, a, a sport. <laughs> so is Weicker, goodness knows. I live in Connecticut and they think, they, they w he probably will be reelected because he has so much seniority that everybody believes he can do more than any challenger. But he hasn't done anything on uh, what's needed, really. He's listed as a, he's conceived of as a progressive, but he's one man in a group. Everybody cites Weicker, but one man is not a party. This question over here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the Republicans are going to have to give, in this next election, we have to give up the idea of the old type of home, um, family and things like that. No, what I didn't wrong? say family. Well, that's what you, that's, that's what it sounded like. Why? You sounded like, <laughs> that's what it's. I think that's what you assumed. I certainly said nothing to imply that. Then what did you, what were I you I said saying? they'd have to find a path beyond, I thought this was a very fancy phrase, uh, <laughs> beyond uh, negatives of, petrified, the petrified forest of negatives. And th th this was a phrase I picked up from World War I, desperate affection for home. That's what they used to call the, uh, Lester, you know that. Yeah, the, uh, the combat, um, combat fatigue, <laughs> people who asked to go home. That was called DAH. In, in World War I, desperate affection for home. I just used it because I liked the phrase. It certainly had nothing to do with family. <laughs> it was meaning the past, desperate affection for the past. I have three daughters and so far four grandchildren and I feel very happy having a home and a family as most of the people I know do. Certainly not a Republican. Uh, Asset. We'll take one more question. I, think I just may I oh, just say sure. one more thing that I don't. I resent very much the Republicans assuming they say wrapping their flag, wrapping themselves in the flag, but wrapping themselves in the family idea that no one else is values family values except they. Ms. Tuckman, I'm a student of education and history, and soon I'll be going into the classroom to teach on a high school level. And I was wondering if you could uh, answer a question that I've been considering for the past year or so. Should teachers try and remain objective as possible in a history classroom, or do you think they should try to impart their own values and ideals to the children that they're teaching? I think the latter. I don't think there's any great uh, value in trying to be objective. Nobody can be objective. Anyhow, there's no point in it. You need a sense of, of belief and, and, uh, and values that are specific. I don't think teachers should uh, regard the, themselves as under obligation to be so, neg so uh, objective. I've never been objective in writing history, goodness knows. I mean, people know quite well that I don't like the Germans, that I don't, uh, um, or the number of other positions. <laughs> and uh, I think um, 
Well, I think it's much better to lay them out in the open than to, con than to conceal them or to hide them uh, in an effort not to show uh, bias one way or another. I would add, add to your question as a beginning teacher, don't worry about being objective. Make your values known. If they're important to you, they'll be important to their students, to your students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. You can just sit down over there again. Barbara Tuckman, thank you very, very much. At 1.30 this afternoon, she will be in the Union Little Theater to answer questions. So if any of the students or any of our people here today would like to show up at 1.30, she will be there. Again, thank you very much for coming. Good morning. It's what's called state of the art, I suppose. <laughs> We're very glad to have Barbara Tuckman with us today, our 80th London lecturer. Uh, she'll be speaking this morning in McCain Auditorium on uh, Where Are the Progressive Republicans? Uh, she is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author and historian. We're very glad to have you on campus today. Thank you. Uh, would you like to uh, open up with some remarks, or statement, or open up a question? Open up for questions? Let them do the work. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to know how you interpret uh, um, with the election, with the campaign going on, there seems to be a, an ongoing quest for militarism uh, in the United States. We keep pushing it even though we're not in war, not at war. As an historian, how do you interpret that phenomenon? Well, I'm not sure that I, I recognize it, sir. I, uh, I know there's an awful lot of talk about, is he patriotic or isn't he, speaking of Mr. Dukakis, which seems to me totally irrelevant because, because of his uh, uh, stand on the Pledge of Allegiance. But I don't think that has anything to do with patriotism, obviously, uh, to me at any rate. Um, there's no question that a, a governor of a state who's been a substantial political figure is as patriotic as anybody else. And I'm not sure that patriotism and militarism necessarily are the same thing. Um, people do a lot of talking, at least the Bush campaign, about in order to have a, t a talking point against his opponent, that he's soft on defense uh, because he's subjected to a number of weapons, <coughs> to the B-1 or to the missiles or something or other. I don't think there's a serious militarism. I mean, I, I don't <coughs> detect it. Uh, I think you could just as well say that there's a, a greater understanding of our use what, uh, what else is a dirty word in America, coexistence with the Russians. That seems to be in my, as I see it, uh, a greater recognition of, of this dual position in the world. 
and a recognition too that the uh, regime over there is uh, trying to quiet down in a way. One doesn't know whether that's just phony or real. But I don't, I don't see a, a very noticeable movement uh, to, to adopt a, an aggressive position by the United States. You think that that has been happening? Well, there's so much talk about <coughs> strong defense. I mean, that's all yeah. it seems they talk about sometimes, and yet we're not at <coughs> and yet we're not at war. That's true. That, I think that's partly um, industrial talk. I mean, to, to um, give the armament industry something to do, and the, Partly it's just to have something to talk about, as you say, and partly because it, it makes men feel uh, tough and manly to talk about a strong defense and um, big, big weapons and that kind of thing. I have to say that I think the militaristic spirit is uh, largely a male thing, uh, which is um, needs to find expression in, in aggression against somebody or some other tribe, so to speak. And a people seems never to be, a national people, never to be happy unless we have a, an opponent to vent our feelings of, of uh, the male fist. That's a feeling. I, have, I think that we have so many other troubles in the United States that I, I wonder if the public may not be coming somewhat more conscious, more aware of such domestic problems. I mean, the deficit, the imbalance of trade, the, the homeless, People, I don't know whether that's a big problem in Kansas, but in New York, you know, one sees them all the time and in other cities. And to think of this great country, this extraordinary continent with its enormous resources and, and extent and its width from sea to shining sea, you know, not being able to house its people is so shameful. I don't know how, to what extent it's really penetrated the, the general public. But uh, I see it as a much more serious problem with its implications than uh, militarism. I think uh, overpopulation is really the darkest problem on the horizon. I hope I'm not repeating what I have in this speech or whether it's in some other speech. Uh, not only, he, not here so much as in, a, in the third world, where we, where of course we are doing nothing to try to control that. overpopulation and the destruction that it brings on our, on our uh, domestic areas uh, and our homes and our employment and everything else. Well, that's about as far as I can go historically. From the uh, title of your speech this morning, uh, where the progressive Republicans, uh, what, what advice would you give to, to George Bush? Maybe you could, perhaps you could sit a little closer to the mic. I think we're, the readings are a little loud. Well, I think 
uh, if you'll excuse my being partisan, I don't think George Bush has it. I mean, I don't think there's much point in giving him advice. <laughs> <laughs> advice for what? I mean, how to win? I personally don't want him to win because I think we would then have an administration which could do nothing to improve the, uh, the serious failures of the past one, from which he appears to learn nothing and had nothing to give. I don't know what George Bush stands for, or what, what he is, or what substance he has. Could you expand on what, how you, what you view as the serious failures of the past? I assume you're talking about the Reagan administration. Oh, yes. Okay. Give, me the, give me the three top failures. The three top failures. <laughs> well, that's one of these numerical, categorical things. Uh, well, I'd say, first of all, of course, the, uh, the inability to control the deficit and uh, the inability to see the need to energize the American public toward a more productive existence, mm -hmm. or to say to say what is the, the trouble at at the uh, present time. I I don't think uh, Mr. Reagan has taken a position which which um, gives the public any sense of what we can do or what we should do. It's more a, a, a non-doing a non that I would fault Mr. Reagan on. He doesn't, I know he, his ideas are, um, we have too much government, interferes too much in, in private life, which I think probably we'd all agree. But without it, we, we don't have the, I hate the word leadership, but we just don't have it from anybody. And I think that's the reason for, um, kind of bewilderment that I get in the public. A little bite here. Why are people always asking me to make speeches, you know, give the keynote speech at some, uh, some uh, IBM meeting down in some resort or other, whatever it is. I mean, what the heck could I say to the IBM executives? <laughs> but there's a great deal of that, various institutions asking you to speak. And I think it's because people think a historian knows, you know, or can tell them where we are, what the world is doing. And because they feel that uh, they don't know, that at loose ends. And certainly, as I see it, Mr. Reagan has not been able to say anything that is an idea or a, or a program or a goal for, for the country. I mean, except to say, you know, America must be one, number one, which is absolute nonsense. I mean, number one doesn't make any, put, put money in anybody's pocket or send your children to school or, or, uh, pay the mortgage or give you a home, being number one is, what is being number one? It's just a phrase <coughs> that he and, uh, I regret to say, Mr. Dukakis' uh, campaign manager was using the other day too, we should be number one again, which I consider absolute, the most banal kind of cliche. 
and empty. Well, in answer to your question, I, I guess the top, what did you say, the top uh, failure? Well, this is the top three. So. Top three. Well, the top one, anyway, seems to me to be a failure to offer any positive idea or program for the for the people of of the country, and then particularly the appointment of people who are, on the whole, contrary to the policies of the agencies they're put in to conduct, such as the, EP, the uh, EPA, where the management has been perfectly, uh, well, really uh, appalling. All they do is get in the way of any kind of controls or regulations. Meanwhile, our forests are disappearing and the soil beneath as a result. And the pollution of water and air has increased, if anything, I believe. And the so-called protection agency, which is designed to protect these subjects is doing no protection because they're not they're not people who are who seem to want to save these these um, situations is it, is it mr. Bush or somebody one who said I'm going to be an environmentalist president or something and he's going to be first one thing and then another but uh, one doesn't have the feeling. I can't think of anybody who feels that this man is going to take hold and, and do anything. <coughs> and I, I would suggest that, uh, well, Reagan didn't actually appoint him, did he, as president or candidate? But um, he hasn't cho chosen innovative, serious people as his advisors. May I ask you, excuse me, are you finished? Yes, indeed. May I ask you how you were brought up that you came to become such a fine writer? Well, that's uh, hard work, <laughs> <laughs> being a good writer. Uh, how I was brought up, I was brought <coughs> up in a um, uh, family, a New York a Jewish family to whom uh, the cultivated mind was very important. My grandfather, who was perhaps the greatest influence, was uh, a man of great charm and great energy who had become the uh, finance chairman of Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson's campaigns and was uh, appointed, he was an immigrant himself, he came over from Germany with his family when he was 12, speaking no English, went to high school and, and uh, came out number one, I believe, <laughs> uh, in his class. Then he went to law school at night and then he went to work in the law office. And, um, concentrated on real estate law. He invented the business of, uh, of real estate being... Lester, are you around here? Yes, I am. What was that, of the grandpa was so important in real estate? Um, real estate is corporation. Real estate yeah, development and, corporate and, and incorporation. Well, whatever. Anyhow, he made his fortune in New York real estate. He spotted the subway place where the express subway stops were going to be and uh, bought property along in that, those areas. And then uh, his doctor told him... Uh, at the age of 50, 
he went to see a doctor. That in those days, you didn't go to a doctor for an annual visit. But he thought his body was important. He went to see a doctor feeling fine. The doctor examined him and said, Mr. Morgan, so you've got a year to live. And he decided if he only had a year to live, he was going to take his four children and show them the world. He quit the practice of law, traveled for a year with his family, came back, and he found that his capital had not only not decreased, but it actually increased without his working. <laughs> and he said, well, if that's the case, I'm quitting. So he quit the practice of law, and he went into politics at age 50. And he had a second career that lasted Fifty till he died at ninety-one. <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, "I have by this time become his doctor." He said, "You see, I owe a great deal to that man who told me that I had a year to live." And uh, he was an extraordinary man. Yes, he was appointed um, in 1914, just before the war, ambassador to Constantinople, and. Um, which was a position generally kept open for deserving Jews. And my grandfather didn't want to take it on that ground. He felt he uh, should have something else. <coughs> but he was advised by Rabbi Wise, who was his close friend, to do it anyway to, to help the situation in Palestine, where the, the uh, population was starving in one thing and another. And so he did. And uh, just then, the war broke out, and the British and French embassies became uh, enemies of the Turks and therefore had to hand over their embassy to the Americans for caretaking. And uh, Grandpa, who was an amateur <laughs> diplomat, if anything, uh, did such an extraordinary job, apparently, in, in taking care of these things. And then he got mixed up with the Armenian massacre, that is, in. in uh, when I say mixed up, I don't mean he partook. But um, he was so appalled by what was going on that he uh, formed uh, the uh, some sort of Save the Armenians Committee. And um, in any, any event, he made a great reputation as ambassador. And that uh, sort of put him on the map. And then he came home because the Turks would not uh, take his advice and, and stop the killing. And he couldn't stand it. So he came home in 1916 to become, uh, he'd already worked for Wilson. This was the second campaign. And uh, become his campaign manager again. And uh, then his. He, uh, his son, Henry Jr., bought property up in uh, northern New York, which adjoined the Westchester. Westchester, all right, adjoined the Roosevelt property at um, Hyde Park, and they became friends. And uh, my grandfather was sort of boosting his son all the time. Anyhow, Henry Jr. was made. Uh, Secretary of Agriculture to begin with, I think it was, and then tre Secretary of the Treasury. And so uh, they all moved in to the higher ranks of political life. And in '32, when uh, in the first Democrat, uh, first Roosevelt election, I had been working during the summer previously at, on the campaign. And the, the election night, my grandfather took me over to headquarters, which was in the Biltmore Hotel, and brought into a room where there was a table about six times the size, only long, and everybody was sitting around the edge with the governor at the head listening to returns on the telephone. And the policeman was saying, make way for Uncle Henry. Everybody called him Uncle Henry because he was very much liked. And we had it, and he brought me up to introduce me to FDR, who looked up like this, you know, he just snowed you. And he said, uh, how nice of you to come down from college to see me elected. And I was just, you know, flabbergasted with the charm of the man. And uh, 
Well, anyway, you asked me how I was brought up. Ma'am? Yes. Um, I have a motion that we need to keep you on, on schedule. Right, I always talk too long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we really do appreciate you being with us today and look uh, forward to your comments at 10.30. Thank you. Did you come on? Did you come on?